Welcome to naturopathic nutritionist and health coach Claudine Thornhill, who is also a writer for Happiful magazine. We'll be talking about menopause, nutrition and well-being, which is a very hot topic. Welcome, Claudine. Thank you so much, Lucy. I'm really, really pleased to be here. So thank you. It's great to have you here. And I said there it was a hot topic. And one of the reasons for that is, thankfully, there is so much more conversation going on about menopause and perimenopause. So I'm really, really pleased that we've got you here today to talk about a couple of these things. But perhaps we can start off with you, as we usually do. We ask our guests to tell us a bit about themselves. And perhaps you can explain what your interest in nutrition, hormones and menopause is. As you said, I'm a naturopathic nutritional therapist and a health coach. So some people may not know what the naturopathic element means. And it essentially means that uh, I take a holistic approach when I'm working with clients. So I'm looking at not just nutrition, but also the emotional well-being, the spiritual well-being of somebody and looking at looking at the person as an individual whole person as opposed to just the symptoms that they've come to me um, and presenting with and I got interested in nutrition and health and well-being I guess it's a number of things just like anything you know you have certain kind of interventions that come in at different stages in your life and kind of lead you in a certain path but I would say that my family is a big influence so coming from a Caribbean background where my parents my grandparents grew up around food just growing in their in their land you know and had a real connection to what was growing and what it would what benefits it could bring to you I was always really interested in that and grew up grew up around those kind of conversations and then having my own health issues when I was at university made me really a lot more conscious around what I was putting in my body and on my body I was always interested in coaching and advising people and I feel like that's a kind of strength that I have just you know innately personality wise and then kind of combining the two you know my interest in food health, wellness, and then the aspect of kind of advising and guiding people and teaching people. So putting those together really and coming up with this with this career of um, a naturopathic nutritionist. And in terms of women and um, hormones and menopause, I would say personally, I've always just been an advocate for women. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman's woman, a girl's girl. And when I was studying, I kind of knew that I always wanted to work around women's health. So part of the reason why I decided to work with women is because I believe that women are a key factor foundation when it comes to the health and well-being of our society in general you know we play multiple roles and such huge roles in in our homes in our families in our relationships in our workplaces you know and our well-being then has a knock-on effect on other people's well-being whether it is our 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 families our children our partners our parents even you know and our workplaces so really I believe that you know working with women making women healthier happier more joyful more fulfilled through diet through nutrition and other elements I think really has a positive impact on society in general and the reason why I focus on hormones is again similar reason really that hormones again play a really massive role and I think sometimes really underestimated in terms of how we feel in terms of our moods our bodies you know in terms of weight gain but also energy um our response to stress our sleep hormones kind of interject in so many different levels in our health and well-being yeah that's why I really want to focus on him hormones as well because I think they really kind of underpin you know our health and well-being alongside so many other things as well but hormones are really interesting to me I mean they're massively interesting you don't realize how much of a role they play Mm -hmm. until perhaps they're out of whack and you're trying to understand what's going on with your own body Mm -hmm. and that's why I wanted to talk to you today because it would be wonderful if we could give someone the support that perhaps other people have had to find out for themselves because Mm -hmm. it can feel so confusing can't it Yeah, definitely. The conversation has moved on quite a bit in the last few years, but I think previously, you know, the conversation around hormones would have just been focused on women being erratic and PMSy and, you know, things like that. But actually, you know, we all need to pay attention to our hormones, men and women, and of various ages as well, from, you know, from teenagers right through to um, um, later years, you know. So, you know, they work synergistically, so it can be a real fine balance to kind of get hormones balanced across the um, across the board. That's That's the interesting thing for me around hormones. We're going to focus in on menopause and nutrition and well-being specifically today what do we need to know when we start to think about the menopause and how do you bring your expertise to that I think in terms of what we need to know I think it's having a good understanding of what menopause is 
um, as opposed to maybe what perimenopause is and what postmenopause is. So I think generally people think that menopause is just about, you know, period stopping and, and women being, like I said, kind of erratic and things. But there are, you know, there are um, stages to it. So I think uh, for a woman to know, you know, where she's at on that stage and to understand maybe what's going on in her body and some of the symptoms that she's experiencing and, you know, what that might indicate. So first of all, we have perimenopause. So that's the period that leads up to menopause and that can happen, you know, it will vary from from women to women, but for anywhere from mid to late 30s stroke early 40s. And that's where we can start to see some initial symptoms. So maybe our periods may become um, irregular. They may um, become lighter. We may experience symptoms such as maybe night sweats, we may um, start to notice maybe a bit of weight gain, particularly around the stomach area, maybe lower energy, maybe disturbed sleep. Um, these are some of the, the symptoms that can occur. And also some of the symptoms that I see in women who are at that stage. And then we have menopause and that's when your periods have actually stopped. Um, again, similar symptoms can come into play and can maybe be more pronounced. We may um, start to experience maybe dry skin, um, maybe thinning hair, maybe reduced libido, um, maybe vaginal dryness, and um, those those kind of elements. And then postmenopause is when the periods have stopped for a period of, t- of twelve months, basically. And again, symptoms from menopause can can continue up to eight years beyond postmenopause. You know, so that can be a, a you know a huge chunk, a huge chunk of time when you're experiencing those symptoms. But there are things that we can do around managing those symptoms. This, and again, I think the conversation is moving on. These kind of stages are not something to be um, shied away from. They're not taboo. They are the natural kind of process through a woman's life. Just like a young girl would go from go through puberty and we kind of accept that as a normal part of, of a woman's life. And then we go through um, you know, pregnancy and fertility and, and those kind of the reproductive years. You know, this is just another cycle in a woman's in a women's life cycle overall. And it kind of is really in line with the way that if we think about just, you know, thinking about energy and and the kind of feminine nature, which is generally about flow and cycles. You know, we think about periods being linked to the moon cycle and um, how the moon cycle is linked to, you know, waves in the ocean. So, you know, that, that nature of women being in flow and cyclical it it is all aligned you know with how things are meant to be so it doesn't have to be anything that we hide away from that is taboo that we don't discuss it is a a really natural thing in a woman's life I could hug you for the way you've just described (laughs) that because that was beautiful in a sea of information about the changes that happen and misinformation I guess and like I said at the top of the podcast there are so many people who are doing brilliant work around perimenopause and menopause now and that is wonderful so let's start off with the perimenopause because some of the symptoms you can perhaps mistake for being tired or overwhelmed with work having a lot going on and not having time for yourself can you share a bit more about that and how we can be more aware of what's going on in that time I think one of the key things is really just to increase that connection and awareness with your body um, and what's going on both I would say both your body and your emotions as well you know the way that we live and work in society we can be sometimes quite disconnected from what's going on internally we can feel certain things and experience certain things and maybe not understand where quite where they're coming from so I would say that's the first step and that's one of the things that you know when I'm working with a client that's one of the positive outcomes that I would kind of have a tick against you know when I'm working with a client when they have that increased awareness because that's from that position that's when you can start to kind of take a bit more charge of your health and start to heal yourself or work more in collaboration with a health professional like a GP you can be kind of talking about the symptoms you're experiencing and why you think they're coming on um, and kind of coming as from a position of an expert of your own body and you know what you're experiencing secondly tracking tracking things as well so whether it is that you use a period tracking app or you just um, you know note things down on your in your phone or on a piece of paper but tracking your cycle maybe tracking your how you're feeling within yourself your emotions also tracking sleep your stress levels and also what you've eaten as well because I guess one thing I would say is that as you said earlier you know women are wearing so many hats and we're spinning so many plates that it can be hard to differentiate if, if it is just the stress or if it is you know the hormones and actually what I would say is it's usually a bit of both and and they kind of feed into the other. Um, so when I'm working with a woman, a woman around perimenopause or any kind of menstrual cycle issue, we're looking at both elements. We're looking at the hormones and how we can kind of 
balance those but we're also looking at the lifestyle and how we can deal with fatigue and might maybe increase kind of elements of sleep hygiene and how we can have more stress management in there because sleep and stress will impact the hormones and hormones will impact sleep and stress you know so we we kind of look at the two together um so essentially you may not even have to kind of differentiate between the two I think it's just actually paying attention to the two and trying to deal with both of them as best you can that's great in terms of tracking in terms of keeping an eye on what's happening in your life outside and I love something you said there, which is going to the doctor as an expert on your own body, because I think it can be very easy not to pay attention to yourself when you are so busy. And then these symptoms start and and you're almost trying to retrospectively piece together what's happening. Exactly. Definitely. It can be a a, 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 the only way I can describe it is a funny old time uh, for women who's just moving into into perimenopause, because you may you you, you may start to think something is actually wrong. Um, That might be the first the first thing um and then you realize what it is but then yeah you've got life that just happens as well and maybe you can't take that time out to kind of connect and pay attention and go a bit slower you know all the things that you need to do to kind of understand what's going on um but I think that is a real requirement and I mean coming back to the GP um element I think yeah it is about trying to come from a position of working in collaboration you know we know that the NHS is kind of under-resourced um, and we know that you know GPs are dealing with a lot so I feel like if we can kind of yeah work in collaboration um, with a GP who has sometimes maybe 10 minutes to kind of see a patient you know we can really get to the heart of things um, in that time that's the best way to kind of go. I agree. And perhaps that helps us get some of the best results when we go ready with what what we want to talk about and what Mm -hmm. we know is happening with us. Mm -hmm. Just going back to some of the symptoms, I mean, I'm I'm sure that there are a number of different checklists that, that people can go through. And there are tons of books, as we talked about out there, and also articles. But some of the ones that might surprise people are things like sleeplessness, night sweats. Is yeah. there anything else people should look out for that perhaps is less talked about when it comes to perimenopause? So what I would say I would see, um, I've seen the most is the elements of anxiety and maybe lower mood as well. I think those are some of the elements that can be kind of missed. And again, I think someone could maybe think about, could maybe consider their lifestyle and think I'm stressed or um, things are going on in life. And that's why I feel this way. Another element actually that I think isn't as discussed can be just a little bit of brain fog sometimes as well I think it is associated with menopause more so than it is with perimenopause but just feeling like just things just need a bit more effort in terms of you know that cognitive function sometimes um so I think those are some of the elements that are least discussed and maybe the least um expected sometimes in terms of mood it can be something that we can feel quite shameful about Mm. you know I know certainly I felt myself feeling more angry about things than I had before that was a real shock to me that I I felt quite aggressive about certain things in in circumstances I know in the past wouldn't have riled me up as much so how do we cope with that how do we cope with that moving through those moods is there something that we can do for ourselves balance ourselves out a bit I think that's a really good point that you raised actually is around around anger as well because that can that can emerge and it can be challenging in a society where you know you're not really meant to be angry (laughs) you know you're not meant to display any kind of anger anyway um you know you're meant to be calm diplomatic sweet nice whatever it is um so yeah that can be a really challenging emotion to kind of um deal with but what I would say in terms of um dealing with those emotions connection for me always come back come back to connection um understanding where the emotion comes from so maybe the emotion itself might be a bit heightened or um, out of correlation with what the event has happened but it is a valid emotion that's that's come up you know there may be a valid trigger behind it so I think understanding the trigger of why you feel this why you feel that way and that might be through disconnecting from the the situation and taking a, a few moments out for yourself it may be at the end of the day journaling around what happened and why that emotion came out in that way or maybe at the start of your day journaling and reflecting as well um it may be that um if you've noticed a certain pattern with yourself within yourself it may be having a bit of a word with yourself you know maybe just setting an intention at the beginning of the day and there are always going to be situations where we know that we're triggered you know but can we set an intention for ourselves around how are we how do we want to show up 
for ourselves in this situation you know it sounds so simple but it can be so powerful when we when we when we speak to ourselves um, and set those intentions for ourselves another element is actually being practical you know in terms of our relationships and and our commitments boundary setting you know again coming back to women wearing these multiple hats and having all these level of responsibility you know and as people that can be very capable of multitasking and wearing hats uh, multiple hats and doing things really well people can start to rely on us more I know certainly in in my experience you know whether it's again family partner children whatever it is you know people will rely on you more because they, they, they view you as capable having said that you know you need you know you need your time as well you know we need we need to be taken care of as well so it may be that you set boundaries and again that's something that I speak to women about often I love the notion of self-work as well. You know, a lot of this is about taking that time, which we find very difficult or we can find very difficult to look at what's happening for ourselves. You know, whether that is the tracking of periods, whether that is the noting down of, you know, when you're having night sweats, whether it's actually putting a space between yourself and the situation that you know will anger you. And also looking at where you are automatically taking on responsibility that is making you feel resentful and then looking at whether somebody else can help or whether it's somebody else's responsibility altogether, actually. And as you said, so many of us are so capable, but it doesn't mean we have to do it all ourselves. Definitely. And I know not everybody has the privilege of having someone to help them in their lives. But if you do have somebody or a friend or just someone perhaps you can talk to and have them reflect back what you're saying and offer up some alternatives, that could be helpful too. I say this to myself a lot as well when you you know you you might start your day and you think right I've got to do this I've got to do that I need to do this I need to do that and it's like sometimes you ask yourself do I need to or is it that um, I feel obliged to you know what is it that really needs to be done you know on those days when you may be feeling overwhelmed or you're not up to it what is it that really needs to be done most things you know you can you have a choice in or you have a choice in the extent to which you do it whether we if we want to do something at 100 percent, actually to, is 60 percent good enough asking ourselves those questions and and you know those that kind of mind talk sometimes asking if if that is actually reflective of reality that's the kind of self-care that isn't on adverts that's the kind of self-care which is about self-talk and actually saying Am I putting too much on my own plate? Am I expecting too much of myself? Am I giving myself a rest? We're going to move on to nutrition because I know you'll have a lot to talk to us about. We're sticking with the perimenopause for the moment. What can we do in terms of nutrition to support ourselves as we move through this period of time? First of all, what I would say is that, um, because you spoke earlier about kind of preparing for perimenopause and menopause, um, and what I would say is that, you know, you can start to kind of take care of your reproductive health and prepare for perimenopause and menopause at any stage, you know, um, even for, um, again, thinking of friends who I talk to who have got um, young girls who are starting their periods, you know, thinking about the kind of period products they're using and the diet and and things like that, because that will stand you in good stead for going through your reproductive cycle and up through to perimenopause. So I would say that you can start kind of preparing for those elements as soon as it, you know, is practically relevant for you. But uh, what I would say is some of the um, things that we can do around perimenopause is we can start to balance our hormones by looking at um, what I would call the balanced meal plate. So looking at how we um, divide up our meals across various macronutrients, basically, to ensure that we are supporting our blood sugar levels, which then help to support our our other hormones so the reason why we do that is that insulin um, is a hormone as well and insulin is quite a dominant hormone so it's the the hormone that is responsible for our energy production and our body will prioritize energy production and ensuring that we have enough energy to go throughout the day and do what we need to do as opposed to our reproductive and and sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone. So if we can eat in a way where we are balancing our blood sugar levels and balancing the production of estrogen, then that will have a knock-on effect of balancing our sex hormones because our hormones all work very synergistically. So if insulin is high, it will mean that it will have a knock-on effect on estrogen, let's say. Again, similarly, if cortisol is high, the stress hormone, 
it will have a knock-on effect on estrogen and progesterone because our body at those times is focused on producing energy so that we can survive and, and carry out our functions and also the stress hormone cortisol is focused on which is cortisol is is essentially you know fight or flight that kind of response so our body's focused on survival as opposed to reproductive hormones which are linked to reproduction and, and childbearing and things like that coming back to it if we can eat in a way which balances our our blood sugar levels our insulin levels that's a good way to go and the way that we can do that is eating a decent I would say quantity and quality of carbohydrates so we want to eat carb- complex carbohydrates so those will be whole grains or those will be root vegetable carbohydrates so whether it is whole rolled oats or whether it is things like butternut squash and sweet potatoes and white potatoes as well and if we're thinking about a plate a meal we want to eat about a quarter of a plate of that of that component then we want to have our protein and um, protein is really quite um important particularly as we move through to move through perimenopause um the reason for that is one thinking about our bone health osteoporosis is a concern when we move into menopause so providing the protein and the minerals that will support our our bone health is quite key also protein helps to keep us full for longer so if we're starting to see a bit of weight gain around the middle that will help to kind of negate that by keeping us full for longer so lean protein chicken and fish and, and things like that so about a quarter of a plate of that and then we want to um, be looking at our vegetables so a good amount of a range of vegetables the vegetables will play a key role and um, particularly things like dark green leafy vegetables in supporting our liver function so um we really want to support that as well because the liver is where um, our body kind of processes and, and detoxes from um estrogen that our body's produced so eliminates the estrogen so supporting our liver function through a good amount of vegetables the energy um supporting our energy levels as well through vegetables that have b vitamins in them so those will be vegetables that are kind of orange and yellow in color and also just providing those kind of micronutrients that support the functions that our body will be carrying out during um, during that time as well so that's how we can balance our, our blood sugar levels throughout that time and I think that's initially a, a, a good way to go um, in terms of other symptoms like night sweats there are certain kind of herbs and things that we can take um, to deal with to deal with those things like uh, black cohort but what I would say is any herb or medicines you need to kind of be mindful of any other medications that you might be taking so I would if anybody was looking at taking anything like that um, I would say to work with a health professional before you before you start to do anything like that that's really great sound advice and obviously we have nutritionist resource so people can find someone to work with in terms of their nutrition and also further conversations It's really interesting you say that about night sweats and other symptoms. One of the reasons to track is to perhaps find out what can be worsening those effects. So I found out that actually if I drink red wine um, um, and not even a huge amount of red wine, that would make it more likely that I would have a night sweat. So it's really interesting once you start to look at the correlation between your behaviours and what you're putting into your body as well as what's going on with the perimenopause. Yes, 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 because the the wine has an effect on your your blood vessels as well. So that that makes um, total sense. And another more practical element is just around your your bed sheets as well. Um, So... um, not everybody can be looking at their mattress, but looking at um, the the duvet and things like that, whether you've got uh, the right tog for what you need and also what the materials are made of your your pillow and your, your duvet cover and things like that. I mean, that's great advice. And is there anything we should try to avoid? It sounds like the foundation is that play. It's that balancing so that we, we're not having massive kind of sugar or insulin spikes, which we can do a lot can't we because if we grab a coffee and a pastry on the way to work because we're running late we've just injected loads of sugar into ourselves and and sometimes it's it's that kind of equation of life versus being able to sit down and eat that plate but there are ways in which we can probably work around that aren't there yeah so one of the elements you just <clears throat> kind of touched on is sugar but then another one is caffeine as well caffeine is a is a stimulant it will raise that cortisol level that stress um hormone which will then have an impact on our um sex hormones so coffee is one where you might want to and i don't i know people love coffee so i would never <laughs> say to eliminate it if you're a coffee lover but um looking at how often you have coffee um try to not to have it too late in the day as well because that can also have an impact on sleep and night sweats so try not try not to have it I say try not to have it later than about 4 p.m to be honest but yeah looking at the amount you have conversely green tea 
although it has caffeine in it, can be um, a great help as well because of the flavonoids in, in green tea. So that that can be a positive element that you can bring in if you feel that you need that, that pick me up from the caffeine. So caffeine, I would say, I think Lucky touched on, alcohol can be an issue as well. Again, I'm not saying to eliminate alcohol, but I would be looking at how often you have it. For me personally, and this is more of a, a kind of lifestyle thing, Sometimes you can kind of be drinking alcohol because it's you're in the environment and it's the thing to do as opposed to actually do I re- do I really feel like that glass of wine? Like, am I having a really nice meal and the glass of wine will complement the meal or am I just drinking because, you know, I'm around other people who are drinking? So I think just sometimes being more conscious around kind of why you're doing certain things as well. But yeah, alcohol can have an impact just because, again, it, it can spike the blood sugar and also have an impact on your 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 night sweat um, symptoms. It's being mindful, isn't it? It's being mindful that... The, what you put in your body is having an effect on those hormones. I certainly used to think that my hormones were just doing their own thing. I didn't think I had any way of impacting them. They were just in there kind of all out of whack. So it's good to know that we can support our hormones and we can actually affect what is going on. Yeah. I would say actually another thing that comes to mind is a couple of other foods actually that we might want to include would be around the beans and the pulses actually. So beans and pulses contain um, phytoestrogen. So these are things like kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils as well. They contain things like phytoestrogens, which are plant estrogens basically. So they have a mild estrogenic effect on the body. So when we're going through penopause, perimenopause our estrogen levels are lowering so introducing some phytoestrogens to just compensate for some of the estrogen that we might be um, losing I think is, is a good way to go during perimenopause and definitely through menopause as well and what I would say to um, look at have a look at I think as early as you can to be honest is looking at xenoestrogens so these are chemical estrogens that can come into our bloodstream through lifestyle really so these are through our cosmetic products um, skin skincare, makeup, shower gels, things like this, where they they contain chemicals which have, again, an estrogenic effect in our body. They're not as mild as the phytoestrogens. They actually have a a more active estrogenic effect effect on our body. They can cause our hormones to become really out of whack. So looking at how you can reduce more chemical-based products and go for more natural things it's like I said body moisturizers shower gels um, even cleaning products that you may use in your house so sometimes even inhaling um, certain cleaning products with strong smells can can have an effect as well um, so looking at how we can kind of go cleaner in terms of the products that we're using both on ourselves and in our households as well and luckily now there's a lot more information about that and we are all becoming more aware of the impact of of what we use both on the environment and and in terms of ourselves as well. One of the topics I wanted to touch on with you, because it's something we see come up a lot, is fatigue. So fatigue at any time of life is really tough. It's one of the symptoms that can come along with the perimenopause and menopause. What can we do for fatigue? Come back to that balanced meal plate. I think that is a, a, a great way to go in terms of providing your body with the right energy content from the um, starchy carbohydrates and the and the veg and the proteins. So I think that's a good way to go, first of all. Also introducing um, some healthy fats into the diet as well. So the healthy fats also provide our body with a source of energy. So whether we're looking at, I think a lot of people would know, but things like the olive oils, the avocados and the avocado oils, also through nuts and seeds as well. So chia seeds, um, flax seeds, pumpkin seeds, people call chia seeds like powerhouses, you know, because they do provide us with that, with that energy. Also looking at, Things like oily fish, so your salmon, your mackerel, those those types of things as well. Another thing I would say is not everybody eats in this way, but one way that you could eat is just looking at having three solid meals per day and looking at your breakfast as well. And some people, some people I work with don't have breakfast, they don't like to have breakfast or they don't um, feel hungry in the morning. I kind of um, reframe breakfast in the way of it doesn't have to necessarily be that you wake up and you eat, but it's a way of breaking your overnight fast, you know, breaking your fast and making sure that that meal that you have that breaks your overnight fast is something that is going to be providing you with a sustained amount of energy for, you know, up to four hours, basically. So something like oats really is a, is a great way to go because it does break down slowly in the body and provides you with a sustained form of energy. Combine protein and healthy fats, again, keeps you full for longer and provides you with a, with a sustained form of of energy so it doesn't like I said it doesn't have to be traditional breakfast food but being mindful about how you break that overnight fast so 
sorry, just taking a step back, how you break that fast also has an impact on your digestion as well. And digestion takes so much um, energy from our body. If we were starting our day off and the first thing we're eating is let's just say for argument's sake burger and chips you know that's a lot of um work for our body to do to kind of break down and digest and metabolize which can then lead to us feeling tired later on in the day so if we have something that is quite easy and simple for our body to break down then the way to do that is by going for the most natural less processed foods that will then be less work for our digestive system and leave that energy for our for our, you know for us to do what we need to do essentially so I would say that about breakfast and then also similarly thinking about the last meal of the day as well our digestive system is wanting to kind of slow down at that time and our body is in tune with our circadian rhythm you know so our body our body has senses and knows when it's daytime and nighttime so you know our di- digestive system is looking at slowing down towards the evening so we don't want to be having anything too heavy or anything close to when we're going to go to sleep because again our body will be using energy to digest and break down that food if our body is digesting while we're meant to be sleeping that will have a knock-on effect on our energy levels the next day we wouldn't have gone through that full rest and restoration that we need um, at night time when we should be sleeping that makes so much sense and I've never thought about it in that way in terms of our body is always performing a job if you like So if it's doing that while we're sleeping, we're not going to be as rested as we should be. That's really, really helpful advice. But let's come around to the well-being part of it. So I feel like you've already given us some fantastic well-being tips and, and really solid things that we should be doing in terms of tracking, in terms of journaling, in terms of taking that time out to put a space between ourselves and something we might react to in terms of actually looking at what we are taking on and and whether we can take on less, whether we can hold ourselves to a a slightly easier standard and looking at what we eat and the, the function that it performs. In terms of other well-being, what should we be looking to do to help ourselves at this time? I think one of the key things is, and again, it just comes down to the kind of the lifestyle that we lead, we lead and the multiple hats that we wear. And also just based on my experience of working with women, um, you know, stress is a major thing that so many um, women deal with, people deal with in general, you know, stress and overwhelm and um, the lack of time for kind of self-care. So looking at how we can, manage stress and cope with you know day-to-day responsibilities I think is is one way to definitely go and the reason why we want to look at that is coming back to that fight or flight response which then has a kind of knock-on effect on our on our hormones as well also when we're stressed we don't make the best decisions you know when it comes to choices around our food um, and also you know um, exercise and movement and things like that you know when we're stressed and we have that downtime usually what we want to do is just zone out sometimes pig out you know but it's usually just putting our feet up and you know having some comfort food and there isn't there is no avoiding stress so the only thing we can do is actually find find ways to cope and and deal with stress I would be looking at um, and it will be different things for different people but you know breath work meditation um, mindful movements such as yoga, something creative, you know, whether it is adult drawing, painting, even just singing, you know, even just putting on some music and singing, you know, just having that that expression. So also, again, thinking about from an energetic level, but even just um, removing things from the throat and having that 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 expression. Sometimes, what we maybe we can't express ourselves. It's just a form of release as well. Yeah, something creative, singing, dancing, drawing, painting, writing, whatever it may be. And then moving, moving the body. I don't necessarily think it has to be exercise, quote unquote, but it can be just actually just moving and shifting the energy through our body. Again, we can store pent up energy or pent up negative energy in our body, particularly for women, sometimes around the hips and the pelvic area. So moving our bodies is is a good way to go, whether it is walking, dancing, yoga, like I said, Pilates, or even just exercise if that if that works for you but whatever way it is just moving your body and then social connection as well and I think we have seen throughout the pandemic and through lockdown how important social connection connection can be to our well-being emotional and mental well-being um so having those people in your life that you can kind of connect with and call on and you know sometimes it might be and I know that uh particularly in somewhere like where I live in London you know it can be some people can feel 
can be very isolated you know there could be so many people around you and not many people to talk to so even if it is that you connect with people online or you find spaces online where you can kind of find a bit of community and, and fellowship that can also be a good way to just kind of take time for ourselves and just find that that level of connection that's great advice and also the the connection and that kind of expulsion of energy through something like dancing or whatever it is that you like to do and because of the pandemic there are so many videos on YouTube to watch for Pilates, you, yeah. yoga, whatever yeah. you like you'll find something you know you want to dance to Britney there's a video online <laughs> for it, for it. Yeah. There's, you know there's something online for it yeah. um, but also that while you were saying that I was thinking joy you know, it's important yes. that we have joy in our lives yeah, because yeah. I think sometimes it can feel very heavy, can't it? Going through this, it can feel heavy and we still are deserving of joy and play. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a key one, actually, that, um, that I would definitely bring in joy and play. And we can forget how to play as well as we grow older and take on these responsibilities. That's wonderful. I think joy is so important. So before we finish, are there any books or podcasts or websites that you would recommend? Because you are right across this. I'm sure you have some <laughs> wonderful ones bookmarked. I would, first of all, um, I would give a shout out to one of my nutrition colleagues, uh, Lamise Brothers. Um, she actually wrote a book called um, How to Have Better Periods. Um, so she's a nutritional therapist as well. And she works around women's health. She, she wrote a book. I think it came out last year. Um, so I would... I would um, highly recommend people check that out. She's also got a podcast as well. One of my resources over the years that I've, I consult is um, Marilyn Glenville. So she's a doctor and a nutritionist. Um, and she's wrote, written books on a range of women's health issues, menopause, PCOS. She's also written a kind of directory to women's health issues, um, which is really good. Um, so Marilyn Glenville is one that I consult um, quite often. Maisie Hill is um, someone that I've become more familiar with in the last few years. Um, she wrote a book called Period Power and she has another book out around perimenopause and she has a podcast as well. So that's another another great resource. And somebody else that I um, really enjoy in terms of their Instagram page, and they've also got a podcast as well, is Karen Arthur, who does, um, who runs a page called Menopause Whilst Black. So it's just giving another angle around um, menopause. And she's so vibrant, you know, and she just she just represents it so, so well. And she also has a podcast as well. So. Yeah, those are some of the people that I kind of look to and, and follow in my own world. That's wonderful. There's so much listening and reading to do. Could you tell people where they can find you if they'd like to reach out to you and work with you? You can contact me via email, uh, which is info at claudinethornhill.com. Um, you can also go to my website, claudinethornhill.com. And I'm also on Instagram, uh, which is at Claudine J. Thornhill. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been lovely chatting again today. Great conversation. Thank you, Lucy.